So the semantics of a program, right? What is that? The semantics of a program, uh, actually, to be very precise, can mean different things, right? So what we mean here is the runtime semantics, uh, which is also known as execution. So when you execute a program, what does it do, right? That's what you're interested in. And Racket can be described in simply these two lines, these two rules. With two si simple rules, you can explain how the execution of a Racket program runs. You don't need anything else. And that might be very surprising, right? So this is the syntax, as you know. And what I'm saying is, you know the syntax, now you know the semantics, assuming you, you understand how to read this. And, and that's basically my role in, in this video, is to guide you through how to read these two rules. What I'm saying is if you understand these two things, you know how to evaluate a function, a function declaration, right? So if you have a function call that has a function declaration, you'll be able to execute it. So let's try to go through it. Um, but before that, I just wanna talk a bit about lamb the lambda calculus, right? Um, and the lambda calculus only has these two rules and it's enough to simulate a Turing machine so it it is enough to describe any program that you might imagine be able to write so you can always encode one to the other um as per the the, the church turing thesis um it is really a cornerstone of functional programming but also a foundation of logic the lambda calculus is crucial in logic and of course in mathematics to to give meaning to what is mathematics um, so there's a lot of work in uh, proof systems that is all supported by the Lambda Calculus. So it's very, very interesting, very, very important to any computer scientist. It was invented in 1930s by Alonzo Church. Um, so this is a side note for you to think. So imagine you only have lambdas, right? Function application and numbers. Can you write a racket program that only uses those three things that never terminates, right? That can run forever, right? Because I just said that this is enough to write any Turing machine. And as we know, Turing machine is any program. So there are programs that do not terminate. So how do I use just function calls lambdas in a number and write a program that does not terminate? Maybe try that as a homework. Okay, so how do we read this? So let's go through the rules. So we have two rules, right? And we have one called E minus var and another one he called E minus app for application, right? So what is eval? So what you will see is that there is an, a little arrow here, right? Um, and the arrow has a thing on the left-hand side and a thing on the right-hand side. Here as well, a thing on the left-hand side, thing on the right-hand side and all of these things as well, right? So what does, does this mean? This means that if you were to evaluate, so this is the input and this is the output. Input, output, input, output, input, output, input, output, okay? So how do we read this? Whenever you have rules, these rules are what is known as syntax-oriented rules. So these are syntax-oriented rules. What does that mean? It means that, first of all, notice that there's one with an a little thing here, right? A little division. And this one doesn't have. You can imagine that this one has one arrow here, but it has nothing on top. So what is this thing on top? Uh, I will explain to you once I explain this rule. So first, what I want you to notice is that on the inputs, you have two kinds of inputs, right? Now, what I want to, you to look at is that the inputs could be a, a thing the input is always an expression, right? So it's either a value, which is an expression, or a function call, which is an expression. Notice that there is no rule for variable, and we'll get to that. But for now, what I want you to understand is that there are two rules, and there is one rule per thing except for variable. So there is one rule for values, and there is one rule for function application. So the syntax-oriented part is saying this, right? So you can think of this as an if. And what I'm saying is, if the input is a value, use this rule. And if the input is 
function application use this rule, okay? So we are just talking about this little bit right here be on the left-hand side of the arrow, okay? So now you may be wondering, so let's, let's just go through this and say, okay, so if the input is a value, you return that value. That's what this is saying, okay? Because this is the output. So if the input is V, V is a value, right? That's what we said before, and when we learned about the syntax, so the output is going to be V, a value, that value. Otherwise, if the input is a function application, what do we do? We're going to do this. So let's learn how to understand this. So first we need to distinguish between the two things that we have, right? So we have two expressions, right? Because any function call has um, an expression for its function and an expression for its argument. So what we did was we call it uh, E of F for the expression of the function and E of A for the expression of the argument. I even painted green to distinguish visually and blue the argument and red you're going to see what it is okay so let's go so what is, this is saying this is just giving names to things so we have the input is some function application uh, where the the function is i'm calling it ef and the argument i'm calling it ea so i'm giving it a name okay so what do I do? Well, the thing on top, you can interpret it as if then else. So if this and this and this happens, then this happens. But what I want, the way I want you to think about it is do this, this, and that so that you can obtain VB. Okay, so how do we think about this? We want to obtain a VB. How do we get VB? By computing this expression. Now just look at the colors. I get VA from this blue thing and I get this EB from this red thing. Okay, so I need to execute this and this thing, right? So let, let me give you the informal intuition. The formal intuition is when you have a function application, you have an expression for the function and an expression for the argument. What you need to do is you need to evaluate the function recursively. That's, arrow is what it means, it means evaluate, right? So you evaluate recursively the function and what you get has to be a lambda, right? The return of that expression, because it's being used in the in the place of a function, has to be a function. And if I evaluate the argument, I get some value. Okay, so I know that the output is always a value, right? Output is always a value, output is always a value. So if I call this function recursively and I evaluate the argument, I get a value. So what do I do with the two values that I got? The one from the function, the one from the argument. Well, I take the lambda from the function and I take the body, the expression in the body. And what I do is I replace the parameter, the only parameter that it has, by the value that I obtain by evaluating the argument, right? So I take the evaluated argument and I will replace, find and replace X by that argument. And intuitively, that's what it should happen. So I replace it, but then I also have to recursively evaluate it, right? So to recap, I take the function and I evaluate that. I take the argument, I evaluate the argument. Then I take the body of the function, I evaluate it, and I find and replace every instance of x, and I replace it by the value that results from evaluating the argument. I take the whole thing, so the body of the function, and I evaluate that. That is gonna be my return value, right? So if you think about a function lambda x, and you pass one, what you're gonna do is you're gonna evaluate one, you're gonna evaluate the lambda, just get the same thing because they're values. And once you do that, you will replace x by one and you get one, which is exactly what I have here. So let's try to understand what I'm saying here. So this, what you see here is what is known as a derivation tree, which is just a way to visually represent what's going on in the evaluation. So what this is saying is, if you have a function call where you're calling a lambda, x with the body x and i'm passing the number 10. what's going to happen is i'm going to evaluate the function and if it's a lambda and because a lambda is a value right a lambda is a value that means that when i oops that means that when i i can if it's a value i have to apply the rule for values right so if it's a value i just return it number is a value, return it. 
So I have the evaluated function, I have the evaluated argument, which in this case are just themselves. Then what do I do? I take the body of the function and I replace the parameter, which in this, is, in this case is x. And I find and replace every x by 10. So if I find and replace in an x, x by 10, I get 10. I evaluate 10 because I have to evaluate the body of the, of the function which returns 10, so v of b will be 10, and this will be 10. Okay, and this is the textual description of all that. Finally, I show you the same notation that I showed you before, but more programmer-oriented. Okay, as you might see, this is way more verbose, but perhaps it's easier to understand for you. So that's why I'm writing it. So what I'm saying here is if I want to evaluate a value, I return that value. And if I want to evaluate a function call, what I do is I take the, f I evaluate the function first and I get something. I evaluate the argument and I get something. And I evaluate the result of finding and replacing x by va in eb. What that gives me is v of b, which is what I return. Okay, so this is exactly the same thing as here, but a bit more verbose, more like programmer oriented. Okay. So these two are exactly the same thing, but as you can see, first one is a bit shorter and more standard with respect to mathematical formalism. Okay. So finally in this slide, what I give you is an informal description, textual description of what's going on. This will be important for a lot of people who dislike this notation. But I recommend, I highly recommend you to look at this slide that explains in English, try to understand it, and then try to understand this one. Okay? So if you can't understand this directly, which is fine because if, for many of you it's the first time you're seeing this, then start from the informal description and then try to understand the formal description. Homework three already includes some formalism that to kind of introduce you to the idea of implementing uh, formal specifications. So in our le next video, we're gonna cover variable substitution, which I talked about when I said find and replace every X by V, right? So we're gonna see that in more detail in the next video.